It's long, it's thick, it's hefty, it looks like something you'd find rattling around in Batman's junk drawer. It's the Atari Lynx. An odd duck, this one, both inside as well as out. And yes, as I love to do, I'm going to be looking at some of the games that push it to the limit. Not a huge library, but I might be able to unearth a few moments of delight if you want to stick around. To start, well, let's have an appetizer of Blue Lightning. A launch title, I believe, from 1989, and doesn't it look a bit good for something that crawled from the 80s? The Lynx was easily the most powerful handheld of its generation, not in every way, but in most ways. Frankly, it had more power than a lot of home consoles did at this point, if you want to get down to it. Based on a 6502 CPU variant, not identical, but very similar to what you would find in the NES, but twice as fast. It also enjoyed the services of the very powerful Suzy Co processor. More on that shortly. It had 64K of RAM, 4 channel sound, a palette of 4096 colours with 16 colours per scanline. The only really bad news was the screen that had a resolution of just 160 by 102 making it noticeably lower res than even the Game Boy. But hey, it's full colour and backlit. You could play it in the dark, you could play it in the park. <laughs> let's, let's not go down that road. Leaving Dr. Zeus style rhyming behind, the screen looks kind of cursed now, but it was pretty impressive at the tail end of the 80s when it launched. And yeah, it was a little power hungry. What you're seeing now isn't quite what the screen looks like in the flesh. To really get a flavour of it, watch this video through a sock whilst throwing batteries out the window. But let's crash on to the meat of this though. Yes, Blue Lightning proves what great things the Lynx was capable of quite nicely. Not a massively original game, this is an obvious riff on Sega's Afterburner, but it does stuff that you won't see very often on home systems of the era. Yes, these sprites are absolutely huge and there's loads of them. The player sprite, which if anything is maybe a bit too large, plus loads of enemies, explosions, missiles and all the ingredients you'd expect from an 80s aerial action game. Considering the resolution, the background is very detailed too, in parts anyway. Lots going on there. It's not just a flat plane either. If you look closely, you can see many of the elements actually stand up against the rest of the backdrop. That's pretty clever. How does an 8-bit game system manage all this, even if it does have a 4 MHz processor? Well, it's all thanks to Susie, the aforementioned co-processor. She is very, very handy with sprites. In fact, that's basically what all Link's graphics are constructed of. Lots and lots of sprites. But let's keep things jogging along and move on to another similar-ish kind of game from a year later. It's Warbird. Yes, it's more old-timey, chocks-away type stuff than Blue Lightning and free-roaming rather than on rails. There's even a multiplayer mode if you could ever track down another Lynx gamer with this in their pocket. There is, though, still a lot of huge sprite action going on in a pseudo-3D world at a fairly smooth pace. Most systems of this vintage would struggle to do anything quite the same. The low resolution aside, the Lynx had some unusual capabilities and a rather strange internal architecture, especially for a console. But hey, before I go on, today's video is sponsored by Hunting Clash. Yes, the hunting season 2021 is in full swing with this thrilling game from 10 Square. Download right now from the link in the description and help support this channel, that would be fantastic. Hunting Clash is free to play and available on both iOS and Android. Breathtaking hunting grounds are available set across the world. Shoot warthogs in Namibia, say goodbye to wild boars in Burma, and why not have a crack at some Eurasian lynx at Lomsdal Vista National Park in Norway? and do it all with a wide choice of weapons from sniper rifles to bows and a whole load of exciting gear like sonars and super buffs. You'll never run out of new and interesting ways to dispatch wildlife. 
There's over a hundred different animals to bag all over the globe, all rendered in incredible detail for a mobile game. Plus, player versus player available through duels and championships. A bit of PvP that always keeps things fresh. And to top it all off, there's events every week to discover and play new adventures. It's on the App Store, it's on Google Play. Download Hunting Clash for free from the link in the description. Shoot some stuff and help support this channel. And also, why not support me on Patreon too? That would be fantastic. Link below and subscribe. Hit that like button. But enough of all this, on with the show. The Lynx is not tile-based, thank god, some people have a real hard time with the way I pronounce that word, that's a hornet's nest I can stay out of for once. No, unlike most other consoles, it's got a bitmap display, with a graphics buffer in the main RAM, more like an 8-bit home computer, and there's just one layer of graphics. And this is where Suzy comes in, the co-processor that can write basically an unlimited number of very large sprites directly into the graphics buffer very quickly. And that's the secret of Lynx graphics. Lots of Suzy sprites all over the place. In fact, using some of the debugging features of the Lynx emulator handy, we can actually see how this works by dropping down into super slow motion and watching as each frame of animation is drawn. Starting out with a blank screen, we can see each of the elements of the scene being laid down. The green horizon first, moving onto those pyramids on the ground and then onto the clouds. Each time we see something appear, that's the Suzy Co processor writing graphics data directly into the memory. Yes, these are sprites, but they work a little bit differently. They aren't just laid over the scene, they actually construct it. And these sprites can be easily enlarged or strung down and even tilted, stretched and flipped, making a lot of things much easier. It allows, for example, these white clouds to easily match the angle of the horizon. And actually, it's what allows these pyramids, hills or whatever they're supposed to be to be drawn too. The sides are just single pixels in the memory, stretched and tilted into triangles, a very easy and fast way of drawing them. Yes, it's the super sprite drawing powers of Susie that help to make the Lynx what it is. And this next game helps to bring that home with more pseudo 3D type stuff, but of a different kind. From 1991, it's Stun Runner. Yes, the arcade was actually genuine 3D polygonal stuff, one of the first games of its kind, Atari being pioneers in this field, but this version is of course a little bit different. Conversions appeared on a lot of home systems, and they were all utter dog do to put it mildly, apart from this before your very eyes, the Lynx version. It's low resolution of course, but it's fast, it's reasonably smooth, and it's surprisingly faithful to the arcade original. It's no great surprise home computers struggled with this. The arcade machine was based around the same hardware as hard driving and was some of the most advanced 3D graphics kit in the world at that point. Even 16-bit giants like the Amiga couldn't hope to keep up with it. So how did the Lynx manage to pull off this pretty reasonable version of the game? Well, a theme is emerging here. Yes, it leveraged its massive sprite power. It is pseudo 3D as I say, not based on polygons or real 3D geometry, but it does do a clever impression of that with a whole lot of 2D sprites. Let's jump back into super slow-mo to see what's going on. Yes, and here again we can see the frame being built up from individual sprite elements. It looks like the track in this tunnel is created from quarter sections that are put together to create a complete ring. This probably saves memory as each quarter segment can just be automatically flipped by Susie rather than having to store a full circular section somewhere. These rings are then stacked on top of each other to create the full tunnel, enlarged with the hardware sprite scaling as they get closer to the viewer. Those weird colour changes that occur are a quirk of the way the system handles colour palettes and yes, this game is one of the few on the system that manages to show more than 16 colours on the screen at once. We can see something similar happening with the outdoor track bits, but it's built up of smaller sections that are laid on top of each other to pave it. Both of these use the painter's algorithm to preserve the 3D illusion, starting with the stuff furthest away from the viewer and working inwards, to make sure the stuff that's supposed to be at the front isn't covered up by the stuff at the back. 
It's amazing how well this all works. The game runs at about 12 frames per second, maybe a little more. Not amazing, that's true, but it still comes out looking fairly good. I should mention that the graphics on this and most other Lynx games are double buffered. What we've seen being drawn is done off camera, so to speak, in a separate section of the memory, before all being sent to the screen in one go, which cuts out screen tearing, making it all look so much better. I don't think you'd see any other system from this era doing graphics this way. It would just bog down enormously. You couldn't fill the screen with pixels quickly enough, but it works here on the Lynx because of its unique hardware. There's not even any sort of culling. Things that won't and can't ever be seen by the viewer are still drawn. It seems wasteful of resources, but Susie can work so fast it's probably quicker to do it like this than come up with an algorithm to avoid it. The Lynx seems to do well with these types of games indeed, but how about we move on to something else and take a look at some more traditional 2D style platform gaming. Let's take a look at Shadow of the Beast. And my word, if it isn't that 16-bit steamroller, that's early 90s Megaton Mega Game shrunk down to the Lynx. Again, we've got to make allowances for the resolution, but this really does look quite nice if you screw up your eyes a bit. And yes, it's got parallax scrolling. Lots and lots of that luscious parallax stuff. Smear some Vaseline on the screen and go and stand at the other side of the room, and you could mistake this for the Amiga version. On the looks side, anyway, the music wouldn't fool anyone who didn't have a real lot of parsley in their ears. Is it an enjoyable game to play? Well, no, not really. I don't think it is. I don't think any version of this game was. People loved it back then, but it's not aged all that well. But I won't editorialise too much, though. It's far from terrible, and there was a great deal of care put into this and every other version of this game. And that parallax, well, it really is superb. It's got more layers than anything you'll see on any 8-bit system, I would say, even including the PC Engine. The Lynx, though, only has one background layer, though, doesn't it? And it doesn't really have hardware scrolling either, not in the way that other systems do. So its approach to this game must be a bit different. Other consoles had multiple background layers that could be scrolled independently to create the classic parallax effect, and often these layers could be further split up into strips, giving some very dense visuals. But here on the Lynx, without that multiple background hardware, it was all done once again with the power of Susie. Let's slow things down again and see what's happening. And yes, we can see all the elements of this scene constructed bit by bit once more. This time though, I'm showing more of the graphics memory, both parts of the double buffer at the same time. Here, the top view shows the back buffer where the scene is constructed, and the bottom view shows what's currently being displayed on the Lynx screen. These two switch when a frame is completed. This time, it's not starting from a blank screen each time, but just overwriting what's already there. So it's a bit harder to see what's going on than with the last two games, but it's the same principle. The various layers of graphics being laid on top of one another, often made up out of regular shape blocks, or dare I say it, tiles. The Lynx doesn't have to, but can use tiles if it makes things easier. The clouds, the mountains, the trees and the ground all overlaid in a way that mimics the multiple background layers of other systems, but made up of Susie sprites. The weird colour changes you see of the background are actually that colour gradient being created, a raster effect that only works when shown at full speed. The scrolling is created by moving the position that these sprites are drawn at in every frame, objects moving off the screen at one side and popping into it at the other. Stuff that's supposed to be closer to the viewer is moved faster than stuff that's further away to help with the depth illusion. Although, as I say, this isn't really scrolling like many other systems, Susie has what are called offset registers, which allow everything drawn to be positioned with an offset every frame, allowing sprite objects to be smoothly moved in and out of view. This is a very nice use of the Lynx's amazing drawing capabilities. I don't think many other games on this system ever did this, despite it being eminently possible. 
Okay then, let's change direction once again and take a look at another of Atari's own arcade machines brought lovingly to its, well, not exactly pocket-sized, maybe sporran-sized handheld, especially made for people with meaty forearms. Again, from 1991, it's hard driving. Yes, home systems struggled with this too. In the main, better than Stun Runner, but still not that great usually. The Lynx has probably the best 8-bit version and one of the more playable versions you'll find on any system. Not that that is much of an accolade because, well, this didn't work that well anywhere other than a $10,000 state-of-the-art arcade machine. Still though, it's worthy of note. It is proper polygonal 3D with a, well, not completely horrible frame rate. And this definitely does push the limits of the Lynx, perhaps in a way that nothing else we've seen so far has. The Lynx has some points in its favour, its CPU is pretty quick compared to other 8-bit systems, and Susie can help out quite a bit too. She can't really fill in polygons, she's not really made for that, but in practice she can be made to do close enough by manipulating sprites in the right shape like we saw in Warbirds. Actually, just drawing the shapes necessary does take up a lot of time in 3D games, and the Lynx does well here, but calculating all that geometry takes a lot too. The Lynx makes a better fist of it than many other systems that this game was shoved into, but it's still not that wonderful. Six frames per second seems to be about what we're getting, and that's probably as good as you could ever hope for. I should probably also mention Steel Talons, another polygonal arcade conversion based on that same hard driving hardware. I've got to admire the spirit that went into this one. It's definitely a brave port, a free roaming helicopter shooter thing done once again in proper 3D. 4 frames per second seems to be about the best that this could do, and the blockiness of the graphics probably hurts it more than hard driving. It's just hard to see what's going on. Again though, wow, this is pushing the links pretty hard in a direction that it was probably never intended to go in. And actually, with that in mind, let's move quickly on to Luchenstein 3D from 2013. Yes, it's inspired by Wolfenstein, and I, I can't even pronounce that in a way that will satisfy those below the line in the comments, so I haven't got a hope with this, but apparently it's some sort of German pun. But anyway, it's a modern homebrew title that I just couldn't resist including here because, well, it does push limits, doesn't it? Not a complete title, but a demo only, but this still looks very good in a low-res kind of way, and it's very, very fast, or at least it is for an 8-bit first-person shooter. Stripped down from the original, of course, apparently the authors were held back a bit by the Lynx's RAM. An interesting point, actually, the Lynx had 64K of RAM, which sounds like a lot for a console of this era, and well, it is actually, but it's not so generous when you consider its architecture. In nearly every other cartridge-based system, the games weren't loaded from the cartridge into the memory, the cartridges were the memory. The game code was run directly from them, with a little bit of RAM just to keep game state data in. Not so with the Lynx, which loaded data into the memory before it could do anything with it, which must make things a bit tight as games get more complex. That aside, this game runs really well, 20 frames per second or so, far better than most of these other recent attempts to get games like this into old school systems. If we take a look at the graphics being drawn, we can see that this game works a little bit differently than anything else so far. In fact, it's made of vertical strips. That shouldn't be a huge surprise though, this game is done with a ray casting engine, and that's exactly how ray casting usually works. I think now though this might be time to start bringing this to a close. There's loads more games that I could feature here easily. Lots of very enjoyable titles that do great things. Battle Wheels here is a definite winner, a very enjoyable game that once again makes excellent use of lots and lots of scaled sprites. The Lynx in the end was not a huge success, but Atari didn't have a lot of luck with much of anything after about 1985, so maybe that's not a huge surprise. It made the moderate sales of the Game Gear look massive, and I doubt anyone at Nintendo even bothered to learn how to pronounce the word, much less consider it a threat. 
But of course, of course, it has its fans, and that's not a surprise either. It's such a unique machine with a small but always interesting library of stuff to shove in it. In fact, with a less extensive lineup like this, you are virtually guaranteed that every game will have something different about it. Road Blasters here doing some clever tricks to give very high frame rates in a 2D racer. But that said, on the other hand, the Lynx's lack of long-term success may be led to it being, well, perhaps not pushed as hard as some other systems. It was no Game Boy when it came to sales and never really had the driving force behind it for companies to go that extra mile. The true potential of the Lynx perhaps never fully exploited commercially. So let's call this one done for now, but maybe one question remains. Given all the power of the Lynx, would it have worked as a home console? Couldn't you up the resolution and ditch the built-in screen for a connection to a TV? Well, if you do that, higher resolution is going to mean lower performance. Would it still have worked? Well, let me know what you think in the comments. And finally, yes, I know, I know, you spoke and I didn't listen. In the most recent poll I did on YouTube, another look at the Super NES came out ahead of the Lynx when I asked you what I should look at next. Well, to be honest, I had both this and a Super NES video in the pipeline, and this one just turned out to be a lot quicker to get done, so you're getting this one first. If you are waiting to hear me talk more about the Super NES, well, hang on, it won't be long. Once again, as this banner is hinting, if you'd like to support me on Patreon, that would be amazing. Please hit the link and sign up to support me. And hey, if you do so, your name could join this list of my generous patron supporters right here. Thank you, as always, guys. Let me remind you all to download Hunting Clash for free. The link is in the description and in the comments. Have a go on it, support this channel and get hunting in 2021. But I will say, as always, thank you for watching, thank you for getting this far, and I'll see you next time, folks.